you should have in your packets with you. They're the first, I gave you four pages. It's actually only three in some books. But uh, anyway, let me just break for us really quickly. And uh, I probably don't need this mic, is that okay? Father, we just come to you right now and uh, ask for your wisdom. God, we want to understand who you have called us to be. Um, Jesus, it is through identity and it is through abiding in you that we find life. And so, Jesus, teach us that it is so much more simple <laughs> than sometimes we make it. Father, uh, teach us again the sweetness of trusting you above trusting flesh or ability or perception. Um, it is simply a posture of leaning into you and staying connected to you. That is where we find life. So Jesus, we give you praise in this place and we honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I'm just going to share with you briefly... Uh, Kind of my own journey. Uh, I started out in ministry full time uh, at a church called Wanamaker Woods in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, had an incredible time there. But um, when I left that place, my youth group was about 70, 80 kids, and I went from a youth group of 70 to 80 kids to a youth group of, uh, on good nights, it would be almost 200, and <clears throat> I was overwhelmed. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I had never been in a situation like that. And in, in Topeka, it was okay to, uh, well, we were just talking about it. Um, I could get by on my natural ability. But all of a sudden, that was not enough anymore. I, I didn't, you know, it just wasn't enough. And so I, I began to literally, I would spend 10 to 12 hours a week just locked in my office, basically pouring over books and, and studying and just asking the Lord, how do I get to a place where I can actually have something of worth to share with these students? And uh, I began a journey, and I, the first book that I read, actually, that referred to any of these guys uh, was Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And he kept referring to A.W. Tozer. And I don't know if you've read any of Tozer or Leonard Ravenhill or Ian Bounds or any of these spiritual classics, but if you will just go read these guys, holy cow, they will change your life. They will change your prayer life. They will alter the way you approach the Father. So this first quote is so good and so significant, at least in my heart, it says, one of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it, and believe it, then the rest of us will be embarrassed. Sometimes I think we make it so complicated if we would just come at it from a base level of God says it, so I believe it, and it's going to happen. Man, destiny is altered and changed in that moment. Psalm 141 has been so significant for me. Um, I finished a master's in spiritual direction, and one of the challenges that we had to do was find a psalm and pray it. And so the psalm, essentially, this is the my paraphrase version, but it just says this, Lord, come quickly. As I worship you, as I offer you my praise, as I fill up my bowl of incense, would you come quickly? And then it talks about that, would my bowl of incense be like the evening sacrifice? And if we understand the context, David was probably remembering in Leviticus the burnt offering, which was the offering that never came off the altar, which was the offering that was aroma that was pleasing to the Lord. Paul said it like this, the living sacrifice in Romans chapter 12. And so this idea is... Lord, come quickly because I'm not going to leave this place until you show up and you consume all of me. It's the idea of let the cross finish its work. I need to die daily. And then it goes on to say all these incredible things. It says, put a bar over my mouth that I wouldn't say anything that would offend you or hurt other people. And then it goes on to do all. It's, I love this part actually. It says, um, let a righteous man correct me. 
for it is like oil on my head. My head will not reject it. How many times do we need just a righteous elder to walk up next to us and say, hey, friend, co-worker, co-laborer, man, you are off on that. My head won't reject it. I'll receive that correction. <clears throat> We're just talking here about humble leadership. I mean, that's what my heart's desire is to be, is to be a humble leader. And so we, we look at all of this, and it, and it just teaches us dependence on the Lord. I think that's, that's what it does for me. Um, I want to read this quote to you because it just blew me up. If you engage with the Holy Spirit because you want to merely be effective in ministry, then you're developing a professional intimacy. And what do we call people who are intimate as professionals? How do we treat the Savior of the universe? Is his personality just a pawn for us to achieve some professional goal? If we understand the intimacy that God talks about, that Jesus refers to, it's the same intimacy between a husband and a wife. If I sit in the room with my wife on a, on a Monday night, She's pregnant right now, so she's very attentive. <laughs> if I spend too much time on my cell phone, if I'm looking at Facebook, if I'm ignoring her, we have a code and she just says, honey, I need some attention. Jesus will never do that to you, but he should. Mm -hmm. He should never have to either. Amen? Amen? So how are we interacting with the Holy Spirit because if we're not fully focused on the personality of Jesus, which in Revelation says he is the man with eyes of fire. If you've ever done contemplative prayer, sitting down and thinking about the man with eyes of fire. The man whose hands are forever wounded on our behalf. I just when you can get righteous perspective of what God has done for us, it changes the way we pray and we just come really low. We just get really low about everything. At least that's what it did for me. And I just learned really, really quickly that I cannot depend upon how worked up, how excited, how jumping around I can get. I have to be full of the Holy Spirit before I do anything. So I want to just share with you about abiding. If you have your Bible with you, whatever, we've got the scripture printed out. I'm going to talk to you. Some Greek words. I might mess them up. Okay? If anybody wants to parse the Greek with me, we can do that later. Nobody thought that was funny anyway. Okay, so. <laughs> John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. In the King James, it says, my father is the husband man. So it means he is the, he is the pursuer. He is the one who is in charge. He is the one who is going to walk into the vineyard and take care of the vine. That just changed even for me. Jesus, God, the Trinity, they are the one who pursues me. And it's weird as a man, I'm just going to admit that, right? It's weird as a man to think about, I am the bride. But in my relationship with my wife, when I met Kristen, we, she was a, our freshman in college and I was a senior. I took her on one date, Rob in the cradle, all right? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> took her on one date. I thought we had a great time. Matter of fact, she came and we were playing in a preseason bowl game. It was in front of the whole college. I got up and I talked because I was a captain. I was like, oh, yeah, right? You know, it was a great moment. Take her out on this date. I'm like, this is locked up, done deal. We're getting married tomorrow. It's going to be the best. 
Well, I don't hear from her for six weeks. Unbeknownst to me, the next week, she's playing in an intramural softball game. She's pitching. A dude at third base grabs a ball, checks it, hits her right in the jaw, cracks her jaw in three places. She finishes the game. It's a pretty tough lady. <laughs> and has her jaw wired shut for six weeks, so I can't talk to her. But I didn't give up. And Jesus never gives up on us. Right. Even if we're silent. Even if we turn our backs, walk away, and run away. He is the pursuer of us. And we always have to remember that because that teaches us humility. If you've ever read, there's an incredible book by Andrew Murray called Literally That, Humility. Super short read. So rich, though. So, we'll keep going, sorry. He cuts off. This means, the, the Greek word is aro, okay, or aro, I don't know. Seminary graduate, most recently. You want to help me out at all? No, you're just going to turn away and look? Okay. <laughs> Let me just give you the definition. It means to lift up, to cleanse, to raise up. So what we view as Cutting away is actually to lift up, to cleanse, to make new. What if you and I just begin to view this? It says in Proverbs, God disciplines those that he loves. What if we just begin to view our prayer time, our pruning time, as God lifting us up and cleansing us? That changes things for me. Because it's not this harsh thing. It's the most loving thing that Jesus can do. I heard this the other day from one of my spiritual parents. She said, even God's wrath is righteous because you know what God's wrath is poured out on? It's poured out on anything that separates us from Him. I mean, that shifted things in my mind. God's wrath is poured out on anything that separates us from Him. He loves us so much, He is willing to dump out the, the most righteous anger there is and destroy whatever separates us from Him. That's a loving God. That's a husband man. <clears throat> Every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified, Catanero. This means to cleanse, purify, prune. So you combine these two. We're raising up, we're being cleansed, we're being purified, and we're being pruned. That's an incredible thing in the process of being disciplined. By the message I have given you, remain, Manio. I just bolded all the remains because this is the key for you and me. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. I want to teach you something that's so simple. Pray, God, tear down everything that hinders love. Destroy it. Our only job in this whole thing is to stay connected. That's it. So whatever hinders love, whatever prevents us from staying connected, rip it out. Because that's my only thing I can do. It's like Jacob. All I can do is hang on. That's a good word. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Guys, if we're trying to do it in our own strength, we are going to fail. And I just, I, I know this spirit exists in our own churches because we're in the Midwest. It's, if it's up to be, if it's, sorry, if it's to be, it's up to me. Or God helps those who help themselves. What? Are you crazy? 
Who do you think you are? You know, like, but that spirit is so prevalent. It's so prevalent. God, break us of our pride. <clears throat> Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. I want to stop here for just a second too, okay? In prayer, you and I have the ability to walk into the throne room as a daughter or a son of the king. And our Father gives good gifts. Even our earthly fathers know how to give good gifts. But doesn't our Heavenly Father know how to give even better gifts? Amen? Amen. And I want to teach you something that I've been learning about. Do you know what the, the right hand in ancient Israel culture was, in ancient Jewish culture? The right hand was the hand of blessing. If you ever read Acts chapter 4, the believers, when they were meeting together and the room was shaken, they asked God to stretch out his right hand. And they left that place and spoke the word of God with great boldness. What if we just begin to pray? God, would you stretch out your right hand? Would you stretch out your right hand of blessing over each one of us? Would you stretch out your right hand of blessing over the sick? Over those who are broken in their marriages? Over those who are addicted? Over those who are caught up in whatever situation? God, your right hand is so powerful it can free them from anything. Just begin to pray that. Because you have that authority as a son or a daughter of the king. You don't have to come groveling for crumbs. You are royalty. So approach it with confidence but humbleness. Come with meekness. Does anybody know what the, the definition of meekness is? Power restrained. Man, if we could have a meek spirit... If we could have meekness in prayer, oh, Jesus, it would be good. Verse 8 says this, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. If we just start doing what Jesus calls us to do, if we just follow after him, he's going to do it. Amen? Just get through this really quick. They have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in me. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love, Jesus did the exact same thing. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Okay, guys, if you will learn to live out of the overflow, if you'll just remain, all of a sudden everything just comes out. It's not worked up. It's not this big deal. You just overflow. It's, Corey, is it player? Play a role. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> so you guys, guys, come on. <laughs> Seriously, thank you, because I've been saying that wrong for like seven weeks now. So I should have asked you in the first place. Is it over the W or is it with the W? Uh, it's double O. So it's P L E R O O. Oh, sorry. I don't have. I just have it in English. I left mine at home. We'll look it up later. Okay. You're awesome. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, verse 12, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I, I have loved you. Verse 13, for there is no greater love than to lay down, tithemi, I might have said that wrong too, I don't know, but this is, this is what tithemi means, to lay down, to set, to place, or to lay down. We are intentionally putting our lives aside for somebody else. This, there's no greater love. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves, but a master doesn't, sorry, because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. Okay. I'm already past my time. So, I want to do this really, really quickly. 
I'm going to read to you a Leonard Ravenhill quote. I'm going to actually read you. So if you go to page two really quickly, okay? Preaching is a spiritual business. Very bottom of the page, second paragraph, second sentence. A sermon born in the head reaches the head. A sermon born in the heart reaches the heart. <clears throat> Under God, a spiritual preacher will produce spiritually minded people. So here's the deal, guys. When we look out at our congregation on a Sunday morning, do we see spiritually minded people? Because if we don't, that's on us. That's on us. We're not spiritually minded. We're not dwelling in a secret place. We're not confiding in Jesus. We're not abiding. We're not going with desperation that the only place that I can find life is in Him. We're working ourselves up and trying to do something that just isn't going to happen. Victory is not won or lost in the pulpit by firing intellectual bullets or wisecracks, but in the prayer closet. It is won or lost before the preacher's foot enters the pulpit. Unction. Would you look that word up tonight? Unction is like dynamite. Unction comes by the medium. It does not come by the medium of the bishop's hands, neither does it mildew when the preacher is cast into prison. Unction will pierce and percolate. It will sweeten and soften when the hammer of logic and the fire of human zeal fail to open the stony heart. Unction will succeed. Amen. Amen. It's Holy Spirit dynamite is what it is. <laughs> the ugly fact is the altar fires are either out or burning very low. The prayer meeting is dead or dying. By our attitude to prayer, we tell God what was begun in spirit, we can finish in the flesh. You know what it says in Ephesians? What is begun in the spirit will be finished in the spirit. So he's literally saying, if you try by your attitude and prayer, if you come and say, I can do this on my own, you're going to take what God wanted to do in the spirit and you're going to try and finish it with your own hands and it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. What church asks its candidate ministers what time they spend in prayer. Yet ministers who do not spend two hours a day in prayer are not worth a dime a dozen degrees or no degrees. Guys, that line right there changed my life. I read it when I was in Denver, Colorado. A lady named Bonnie York brought me this book. She was one of my youth sponsors, and she said, Pastor, I want you to read this. She's like, I think you'll like it. I didn't like it. <laughs> but it changed my life. Absolutely radically altered my life. I want to tell you practically what's happened now. I started praying on my own. On my own. I, I am an early morning guy. It's... I don't know about you guys, I'm getting, I'm about to turn into a pumpkin. It's been a long day. But here's the deal. I started praying on my own by myself. When we got to Parsons, we've been in Parsons now, I've been there 22 and a half months. When I got there, I started asking a group of guys. A group of guys has met me. We met for 20 months. I had to stop, I just had surgery not too long ago. But we met for 20 months at 5 a.m. Monday through Wednesday, every morning, Monday through Wednesday, met and prayed together. My two ladies over here, I like to call them, they should be renamed the sons, the daughters of thunder, okay? Prayer warriors, they pray together all the time. We try, we're still trying to get the rhythm together, but we try to praise the staff two times a week. We pray on Wednesday nights, we pray on Sunday mornings. It is an expectation for our board, and our board is not fulfilling it. I'm just going to be super honest and up front. I've asked our board to attend at least one prayer meeting every week. You can come at 5 in the morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You can come at Wednesday night, or you can come Sunday morning. I want to just tell you what has come out of our prayer meetings. <clears throat> Terry Goody, 
has been sober for 540 some days. On a Wednesday night, a man walked over and laid hands on him and prayed, and he was freed up right there from a 12-pack a night addiction. About two months ago, we were sitting together praying, and in January, my wife and I wrote down in a prayer journal, we need somebody to start Celebrate Recovery. It was running in our church, but it has stopped for a while. And Terry looked at me in an early morning prayer, and he said, Pastor, I think I'm supposed to start to Celebrate Recovery. And I opened my prayer journal, and I said, buddy, look right here. In January, Kristen and I said, Terry and Robin Goody would be perfect to run Celebrate Recovery. May this last year, we were having an extremely tough time with worship, and it's still not fully resolved. But I got the crazy idea to cancel worship for five Sundays. And by worship, I mean public singing, not worshiping God. <laughs> we served our community, had a whole bunch of work projects that Pastor Christy and Lynette helped me set up, canceled, fully canceled worship, all the, well not worship, but canceled service, <coughs> and went out and actually served our community and then had a huge barbecue. One Sunday morning we put all round tables in the whole sanctuary and we had breakfast together on Mother's Day. Um, we did a whole bunch of different things. Our average attendance dropped by almost 100 people for that month. But the first Sunday that we did it, in the offering, was a tithe check for $52,000. That's never happened. And God is being so faithful. Even when it is, <clears throat> it's hard. It's super hard. But we have agreed together as a staff that we're going to put intimacy with the Lord above everything else. Amen. And out of that overflow <coughs> comes whatever comes. But we're going to be obedient. And Jesus is going to lead us. And we're going to see whatever God wants to do <coughs> in Parsons, Kansas happen. I want to challenge you with this, guys. Start praying for specific things. If you don't have a prayer journal, start keeping a prayer journal. If you get, if you have a gathering of people to pray together, start journaling prayers together as a community. Start keeping track because God's going to start answering them. Pastor Christy, mm -hmm. how many prayers has God answered in your prayer journal? Pages have been answered. Mm -hmm. These two ladies, and I'm, they would never want me to talk about this, but do you guys know what a Daniel fast is? Mm -hmm. They did a Daniel fast for 43 days. Just finished it up. And we're praying for some specific things, and God totally delivered. Praise God. Amen. If you will begin to practice spiritual disciplines and just be dependent on the Lord, holy cow, we'll do incredible things. Yeah. So let's wrap this up because we're all about to fall asleep. Okay? Read these books. Just pick one. Just pick one. <clears throat> Jesus, we come to you right now. We ask for you to move in this place. Jesus, we're desperate for you. We can't do this on our own, God. We have challenges in each of our churches. And Father, they, they seem like a life, but I, I'm reminded that you give us five smooth stones and a sling, and then we can cry out, who can stand against the armies of the living God? Yes. And so, Father, we come in the authority that you have given us that we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And so, Father God, I just pray 
for confidence, a Holy Spirit confidence to fall in our hearts right now, God. Yes. That we would come in agreement with what you want to do in Southeast Kansas and in Missouri, God, Southwest Missouri. Yes. God, that you want to bring revival in this yes. place. Yes. And God, we're hungry. We're desperate. We want to see apathy broken. We want to see yes. the orphan spirit broken. We want to see poverty broken, God. We want to see people get desperate again to call on the name of the Lord and confess their sins, God, and Amen. come back to a place of repentance. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, Amen. that you would move in a way that would change the destiny yeah. of generations, yes, God. Yes, God. That we would press in and we would get desperate as leaders, that we wouldn't be content oh, with God. one person coming to the altar, God. We're thankful, Jesus, for one life, but Jesus, we want to see hundreds. We want to see thousands. Because we want your name to be famous. Yes. We don't care if anybody ever knows who we are. We don't care if anybody ever knows about what we've done. We just want you yes. to be glorified. Yes. Jesus, you've given us a time to be in the fields. And you told us to pray to the Lord of the harvest. To send out workers. Jesus, even in my own city, 65% of people don't attend church. God, give us a burden. Yes. Give us a burden, God, for lost and broken people. Give us a burden, God, for those who are on the margins and those who are hurting and those who are buying lies and those who have been so bound up by Satan they don't even know up from down. And Jesus, we just have the ability to speak life and to say the God of heaven is not angry. He loves you. He's come to set you free and to give you life and to set your feet on a firm foundation, a rock that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that is coming that will never be destroyed. Oh God, the joy of this life is to know you. Help us to lead people to a place of knowing you. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, God. Teach us to be humble. Teach us to pray, God. Yeah. Teach us to come in agreement with what you say about us. Teach us identity, Jesus, but teach us above all things to abide in you. Jesus, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mike. Okay, guys, tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock.